thank you to the committee uh, for this award, uh, which I am honored and humbled uh, to receive, especially given the amazing list of finalists um, that you showed. It's nice, of course, to receive any recognition, uh, but this award is particularly meaningful to me because it acknowledges Soul City as an essential part of the civil rights movement. Many critics of Soul City uh, and of its founder, Floyd McKissick, argued that it was a departure from the movement, that Soul City was a rejection of integration and that it would set the country back decades. As one Southern newspaper put it, when McKissick announced his plan to build Soul City in January 1969, how terribly tragic it would be should all civil, ro all civil rights roads cut in the past 20 years lead to Soul City, a Camelot built on racism. But McKissick had a different view. He viewed Soul City as a natural continuation of the civil rights movement and of the movement's central slogan, Freedom Now. The difference is that McKissick embraced a positive vision of freedom instead of a negative one. To McKissick, freedom wasn't simply the lifting of barriers that had kept Black people from eating at white lunch counters or riding in the white sections of buses and trains or enjoying parks and swimming pools and theaters and other forms of recreation. To McKissick, freedom meant having the economic means to partake of all these things. As he liked to say, what good was the right to sit at a lunch counter if you didn't have the bread to buy a burger? McKissick also believed that freedom entailed political self-determination, which again, he thought could only be achieved through economic independence. As he wrote in his book, Three-Fifths of a Man, unless the black man attains economic independence, any political independence will be an illusion. Soul City then was an attempt to achieve the movement's goal of freedom now, with freedom defined more positively and expansively than had often been the case. It is very much a part of the story of the civil rights movement, and I am so, so pleased to see it recognized as such. This award is also special because Benjamin Hooks and Floyd McKissick had much in common. Both men were born in the South, raised during the Great Depression served their country during World War II, practiced law, um, and led major civil rights organizations. Both men also understood the relationship between economic self-sufficiency and racial equality. As a member of the Federal Communications Commission, Dr. Hooks advocated for greater minority representation in the broadcasting industry and an improved image for Black Americans in mass media. And as executive director of the NAACP, he stressed the importance of self-reliance in the struggle for freedom. Both men also continued their work into the 1970s and 1980s, insisting that although the goals and strategies of the civil rights movement had changed, the movement itself was not dead. That was certainly how McKissick thought of Soul City, as a new chapter in the struggle for racial equality, but still part of the same overarching story. So you can see why it gives me such pride uh, to receive this award, which I view not so much as a recognition of my work, but as a recognition of the work of Floyd McKissick and those pioneers who moved with him to rural North Carolina to build Soul City. Before telling you more about the work those pioneers embarked on, I want to tell you a bit about what brought me to this project. Because you might be wondering how a white law professor from the Northeast found himself writing about a predominantly Black community in the rural South. The first thing I should note is that like Soul City, I was born in 1969 in the state of North Carolina. In fact, just a few hours down Interstate 85. But although I had often driven past the exit that leads to Soul City, it wasn't until two decades later when I was a young reporter at the News and Observer in Raleigh that I first heard of the town's existence. This was in April 1991, one month after the beating of Rodney King by Los Angeles police officers, when the country was in the midst of what many people described as a racial reckoning. An editor stopped by my desk one day to tell me that Floyd McKissick had died. And as he discussed McKissick's career as a lawyer and civil rights leader, he referred offhandedly 
to the, quote, all-Black city that McKissick had attempted to build in the 1970s. Now, back then, it wasn't possible to research a topic with a few clicks on a computer keyboard. So I filed that information in the back of my head, and I forgot about it. But I remembered that discussion in 2014, after the killing of Michael Brown by a police officer in Ferguson, Missouri, when the country was in the midst of another racial reckoning. And when I began to research the history of Soul City, I learned that my editor's description had been inaccurate. Soul City was never meant to be all black. I also learned that the News and Observer, the paper that I had worked at, had played a significant role in fostering that misperception and in bringing about Soul City's demise. And although I had not been a part of the paper during that time period, I nonetheless felt an obligation to set the record straight to provide an honest reassessment of Soul City and explain what led to its downfall. But what really inspired me to write the story of Soul City, what made me think this was a story worth telling 50 years after the fact, were the parallels I saw between what McKissick was trying to accomplish in building Soul City and the protests that were unfolding in Ferguson. Black residents in Ferguson were not just lamenting the death of Michael Brown. That incident is what triggered the unrest, but the frustration and bitterness had been building for decades as the percentage of black residents increased, but whites retained control of all aspects of city government. By 2014, Ferguson's population was 67% black and 30% white, yet its government was staffed almost entirely by whites, from the mayor's office to the school board to the police department, which had only three black officers out of a force of 53. Now compare that to Warren County, North Carolina, where McKissick purchased the land to build Soul City. In 1969, Black people made up two-thirds of the county's population, yet as in Ferguson, whites controlled all the local institutions, the county commission, the school board, and the local police department, which had only recently hired its first Black police officer. Warren County was also the site of significant Klan activity, a fact made glaringly clear by a sign on a nearby highway that read, you are in the heart of Klan country. And in the spring of 1970, in the nearby town of Oxford, a white store owner and his two sons had killed a black man who allegedly made a flirtatious remark to the owner's daughter-in-law. Those men were acquitted, leading to a rebellion by the town's black residents that was not dissimilar to the rebellion in Los Angeles in 1992 or to the rebellion in Ferguson in 2014. So it seemed clear to me that what black residents in Ferguson were demanding was the same thing McKissick was seeking five decades earlier, respect, dignity, and control over their own destiny. And it was the story of that quest as embodied in Soul City that I wanted to tell in this book. So let me share with you some of what I learned about Soul City and McKissick. I've already briefly sketched out McKissick's career as a lawyer and a civil rights activist. He was the director of the Congress of Racial Equality, and he was the leader of countless protests and marches, including the Meredith March Against Fear in 1966, which was chronicled so powerfully by Professor Aram Gutsuzian in his book, Down to the Crossroads. I've also explained how McKissick had come to embrace a positive vision of freedom that emphasized economic independence and self-sufficiency. As head of CORE in the late 1960s, he shifted that group's focus to the problems of the urban poor, launching anti-poverty programs in Baltimore and Cleveland, and proposing a series of Black cooperatives across the South. But like Martin Luther King and other civil rights leaders, McKissick found it more difficult to address systemic problems of joblessness, inadequate housing, and economic inequality than the segregation of buses and lunch counters. So he began to think about a more radical solution to the problems he had identified. And that solution to McKissick was the building of new cities for Black Americans. To McKissick, the building of new cities offered a number of benefits. First, By offering an alternative to existing cities, 
He thought that they would ease the overcrowding and misery that existed in many of the northern slums. Second, if built in the South, McKissick thought new cities could reverse the outmigration of poor Blacks to the North. Finally, and most importantly, McKissick thought new cities could give Black people the control and self-determination they lacked in white-dominated communities. McKissick initially hoped to pursue his idea of building new cities through the Congress of Racial Equality. But when he presented this plan in the spring of 1968, the group's National Action Council rejected it as too ambitious and impractical. So McKissick stepped down from his position and decided to pursue the dream of building a new city on his own, traveling to North Carolina that fall to scout for land. He soon found what he was looking for, a 5,000 acre tract of land in Warren County in the north central part of the state. In many ways, it was a really unlikely place to build a new city. It was one of the poorest, least developed counties in the country, 40% of residents lived below the poverty level. Seven out of 10 adults had not graduated high school. The county seat had only 2,000 people. And the nearest city of any size, which was the Raleigh-Durham area, was more than an hour away. But the site had advantages. The land was cheap. Labor was cheap. And it was close to two major highways, several large lakes, and a major railroad line. McKissick purchased this plot of land in early 1969 and announced plans to build a city of 18,000 people over the next decade, a projection that ultimately grew to 50,000 people by the year 2000. And over the next few years, he and a small staff moved to Soul City and began the most basic aspects of the job, hooking up electricity, connecting to wells, converting an old barn into an office, and restoring an old manor house on the property. They also began a process of intensive planning with the help of a variety of institutions, including the Harvard Business School, the University of North Carolina Law School, and the UNC School of Urban Planning. McKissick's idea was to build a new kind of city that would avoid the chaos of the megatropolis and the blandness of the suburbs. It would be integrated, both racially and economically, but its primary purpose, McKissick always made clear, was to help Black people, especially those who were poor or unemployed. So how was McKissick going to go about financing a project like this? Well, initially, he received financing from private investments and government grants in order to undertake the, the planning of the city. But in order to prepare the land for development, he needed a large outlay of capital anywhere from $30 million to $50 million. And not surprisingly, in 1969, there weren't many places uh, a Black man could get his hands on that kind of money. As it happened, however, McKissick wasn't the only one interested in building new cities. A year prior, Congress had enacted one of the last pieces of great society legislation, the New Communities Act of 1968, which authorized the Department of Housing and Urban Development to finance the building of new towns across the country and allocated $500 million for that purpose. McKissick submitted an application to HUD in 1969 and waited to get approval. Three years later, he was still waiting. So he made what would turn out to be a fateful decision. In the summer of 1972, he switched to the Republican Party and endorsed Richard Nixon for president becoming the country's most prominent Black Republican and serving as Nixon's chief Black spokesman on the campaign trail. Shortly thereafter, Soul City received a $14 million loan guarantee from HUD. If this seems like a bizarre political union, it was. On the one side, you had Nixon, the quote, law and order candidate whose Southern strategy had exploited racism to win white votes. On the other side, you had McKissick, a militant black power leader whom the FBI had branded one of the most dangerous men in America. It was a union that raised more than a few eyebrows with many Republicans questioning Nixon's judgment and a lot of prominent blacks accusing McKissick of selling out. But like most political unions, there were advantages for both men. 
For Nixon, Soul City was a chance to improve his image among black voters without risking his support among whites. McKissick, meanwhile, desperately needed federal support to get Soul City off the ground. And the loan guarantee instantly gave the project a jolt of momentum and credibility, with major corporations such as General Motors and Miller Brewing Company showing interest and the national media showering Soul City with praise. There was also progress on the, on the ground. A three-county water system was installed, providing Soul City up to 2 million gallons of water a day. Roads were paved, underground electrical wires were laid, and the city's first major building, a healthcare center, opened. The population also increased, and Soul City began to feel like a real community, with a tourist center, newspaper, concerts, and a Head Start program run by McKissick's wife. But just as Soul City began to gain momentum, it came under attack. In March of 1975, just one year after the first federal funds were made available, the Raleigh News and Observer, my old paper, published a series of 17 articles that painted Soul City in the most unfavorable light possible. The series began by claiming that Soul City had been a political reward for McKissick's support of Nixon. It went on to make vague and sometimes convoluted charges of nepotism, conflict of interest, and financial mismanagement. It also faulted McKissick for not having made more progress after six years of work, failing to point out that HUD had only released the first $5 million in bonds the previous year. This newspaper series had a devastating impact on Soul City. The articles were picked up by the national media, and Soul City soon became a punchline in editorials and cartoons. More importantly, they caught the attention of Jesse Helms, a first-term senator from North Carolina and an early opponent of Soul City, calling the project, quote, the single greatest waste of public money that anyone in North Carolina can remember, he demanded a suspension of all funds to Soul City and a congressional investigation into the newspaper's allegations. That investigation, which took nearly a year, ultimately cleared McKissick and Soul City of the most serious allegations. But the scandal delayed development for a year and cast a cloud over the project that scared away private investors and weakened McKissick's support in Washington. Over the next few years, McKissick and his staff worked to regain momentum. HUD initially renewed its commitment to the project, releasing a second $5 million bond, and building resumed. A 72,000 square foot industrial plant was completed. Construction began on a pool and recreation center, a fire department, a strip mall, a lake, and the first subdivision of houses. But the project struggled to attract industry. And in 1979, after a consultant concluded that Soul City was no longer viable, HUD pulled the plug, assuming control of the property and paying off the $10 million in debt. Today, Soul City is a modern ghost town. Most of the original residents have left. The buildings are vacant. The streets are cracked and crumbling. And that factory that was supposed to pave the way to Black economic freedom, it's been converted into a prison. One of the things I set out to do in telling the story of Soul City was to understand why it failed why a project that had so much promise and momentum uh, ultimately um, uh, couldn't reach its goals. One possible answer, an answer that many people have offered, is that Soul City was simply impossible from the beginning. That attempting to build a city of 50,000 people in a remote poverty-stricken area with no economic base was simply too ambitious. You add in the dismal economy of the 1970s, a combination of inflation and stagnant growth, and it might simply be that Soul City was doomed from the outset. But I think that that answer is overly deterministic. Although most of the new towns supported by HUD also failed, one of them, the Woodlands, Texas, survived, and today is a thriving city of 110,000 people. In addition, Privately financed new towns, 
such as Reston, Virginia and Columbia, Maryland also succeeded. So what is it about those cities that helps to explain why they succeeded and Soul City didn't? Well, for one thing, those projects had far greater resources. The Woodlands received five times as much federal money as Soul City did, and it was founded by an oil magnate named George Mitchell, who was able to raise significant amounts of private capitals to support his city. Perhaps most importantly, the cities that succeeded were predominantly white. The Woodlands, Texas is today 87% white. So perhaps the explanation for Soul City's failure is a simple one. Perhaps it's simply racism. And there's certainly evidence to support this proposition. Jesse Helms was a notorious race baiter who did everything in his power to stop Soul City. And much of the media coverage of Soul City had a racist subtext, referring to it as an all black town, even after it had been made clear that it was designed to be integrated and drawing on a variety of classic tropes about black people and money, that they can't be trusted, that they're incompetent, or that they live beyond their means. A front page article in the Wall Street Journal even suggested that McKissick was getting rich off Soul City, noting that his house had a quote, sunken living room and a quote, big microwave oven. But overt racism only explains so much about what happened to Soul City. The white people closest to Soul City, those who lived in Warren County and surrounding areas, were surprisingly receptive to the project, primarily because they recognized the positive effect it could have on a depressed region. Instead, Soul City seems to have been caught between two opposing forces. One was the blatant racism of Jesse Helms and other conservatives. The other was liberal integrationism, which viewed any departure from the ideal of integration as a betrayal of liberal principles and per perhaps as a threat to the status quo. One can see this most clearly in the role of the News and Observer, which led the charge against Soul City. An ostensibly liberal paper, the NNO was headed by Claude Sitton, who had covered the civil rights movement for the New York Times and was generally viewed as sympathetic to the cause. But for many white liberals like Sitton, freedom and equality came in only one form, integration into white society. Any approach that looked like separatism was automatically unacceptable. As Sitton told an interviewer years later, when asked why he opposed Soul City, quote, I just didn't think that was right. I mean, I was an integrationist, and so we couldn't go along with that. One can also see this element in resistance to the name of Soul City. Although McKissick claimed that Soul was a reference to spiritual matters, not racial ones, the name proved to be an obstacle from the beginning, with both HUD and General Motors arguing that it suggested a separatist community. A consultant later agreed and urged McKissick to change the name. But McKissick, who was willing to compromise on virtually every other aspect of his plan, refused, telling one reporter, quote, if I change the name, I will have lived my life for nothing. All of which suggests that Soul City was a victim, as much a victim, of liberal integrationism as white racism. These two forces may have started from very different perspectives and motivations, but in the end, both were willing to deny McKissick what he wanted most, which was autonomy and self-determination. And it's that part of the story that seems most relevant to me today. In the half century since McKissick founded Soul City, the gap in income between white and black households has remained essentially unchanged. And black people continue to be unemployed at twice the rate of white people. More importantly, the economic independence that McKissick was seeking has remained elusive, as we can see in cities such as Ferguson. I hate to end presentations like this on a pessimistic note, and it would be naive to suggest that there is a quick or easy solution for achieving the goals that McKissick had. But I do think that the story of Soul City points in some obvious directions. First, I think it highlights the need 
for greater investment in Black communities and Black-owned businesses so that entrepreneurs are not per perpetually dependent on white institutions for support, as McKissick was. Second, I think the story of Soul City shows the value of diversity in business and media as an antidote to the kinds of stereotypes and misperceptions that Soul City faced. Third, it underscores the importance of protecting voting rights so that elected officials such as Jesse Helms can be held accountable for sowing bigotry and hate. And perhaps most crucial, the story, the story of Soul City serves as a reminder that racial equality cannot be achieved without letting Black people show the way. White people must be willing to take seriously what Black Americans and all people of color are saying and to have some humility about their own wisdom. Had white critics of Soul City heeded that lesson, I think, Soul, uh, McKissick's dream might have turned out very differently. <laughs>